I sought the Lord and asked for help to discern the times. Recently, I believe God answered that prayer in giving me two distinct visions that I want to share with you. You know, the first was a vision of tug of war. It was, it was, uh, it was a family uh, with two different people on each side and the family was divided and they were tugging against each other. And in this vision I had, it was like in my spirit, something that I just understood about the moment is that while the family was tugging back and forth, they didn't even know what they were really tugging over, but it was intense and it was important to them. And they wanted to take the time to stop and figure out what they were fighting over, but they couldn't because they were afraid if they let go of the rope, they were gonna lose. The other vision that I had was just this mob of people and there was uh, dust everywhere. It wasn't, it wasn't smoke, it wasn't like a riot, that, uh, that wasn't the vision. It was just a bunch of people and there was chaos and I couldn't actually see fighting, like physical fighting, but it was clear that everybody was screaming and nobody, you couldn't even tell what was going on. It was just like mass chaos. People were throwing dirt in the air and it was just, it was, in, uh, insane is what it was. It reminded me in a, a story in the book of Acts where the Apostle Paul uh, was, was preaching and just to stir up havoc and, and get him out of town, a bunch of agitators started this false riot. And when they were asked what they were writing about, they didn't even know. They were just joining the mob, if you will. And one of the things that is important about that particular uh, vision, if you will, that, that dream is that while everybody's agitated and everybody's fighting, the reality is I don't think we all know what we're fighting about. And you're never going to win a fight. You're never going to win a battle if you don't even know what enemy you're really facing. I want to try to provide some insight and some, some helpful direction uh, to the church concerning the times that we live in. And before I say what I'm about to say, I want to preface it with this. I've spent months thinking about these matters. I haven't actually spoken publicly yet on what I believe about masks and how we should be living in such a time as this and what our response should be and what is the role of the U.S. government and what is the role of the church in all of this. And I want to address some of those things and maybe break them down into three categories that I think we're fighting over, we're, we're tugging with each other over. First of all, one of them is personal freedom. A, a lot of the frustration right now and the, um, the, 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 the fighting, if you will, is related to personal freedom and trying to hold on to our rights that we've had as Americans for uh, most of us our entire life. Secondly, we're arguing about government and, and what we believe the role of our civil government is. And third, we're arguing about what should the response of the church be? And when all these things, it's like you get that picture of the dust in the air, we don't even know how to focus on one and deal with it correctly. And I wanna kind of break them down. And before I deal with all three of those, which I'm going to, I wanna give you one analogy that I think is really important. If I was to take what I believe and put it in a nutshell, nobody said it better than C.S. Lewis did in 1948 when he spoke about the atomic bomb. I would encourage you, if you're not familiar with the quote, to take some time to Google it later, look it up, uh, C.S. Lewis, Atomic Bomb Thoughts. What he said in essence was this, how should we live in an era when the possibility of an atomic bomb dropping on our community and decimating us, how should we live in such a time? And here's what he said, why we should live like we always have. I suppose we should live like those who did in the 16th century when the plague would come every year and wipe out a multitude of their people. Or maybe we should live like those who, during the time of the Scandinavian Vikings, at any moment their shores could have been uh, overtaken and their throats could have been slit and they, their children and wives could have died. And his point was they had to go on living. He goes on to say the reality is we're all gonna die and the unfortunate truth is that some of us are gonna die painful and slow deaths. And the fact that one more way has been discovered that we might die should not change the way we do live. I couldn't agree with him anymore. He goes on to say that 
if we were to get hit by an atomic bomb, let the atomic bomb, when it comes, find us doing sensible things, praying, going to school, talking with our neighbors, and living life. You want to know what I believe in a nutshell? That's what I believe in a nutshell. I want to take a moment, though, to kind of dig into that statement and explain why it doesn't fit every scenario. For example, if we knew with absolute certainty during the 16th century that somebody had the plague, we certainly wouldn't surround ourselves, our family and our children around the people that we knew were contagious. If we knew with certainty during that period of the time of the Vikings that on a given night that our homes were going to be wrecked and our families were going to be ravished, surely we would leave and not stay there and just let it happen. The point I'm trying to make is that there's balance. We must remember that while we should be living life as normal, we also can't jump off of a cliff as Satan tempted Jesus to do with full knowledge that danger is ahead and expect that God must rescue us when we rush headlong into danger. So I want to encourage you guys to be balanced. I think it's one of the things that we've got to do. We've, we've got to uh, reject this narrative of extremes, which we have been just thrown extremes. You're either this way or you're that way. You're on this side or you're on that side. We must reject that narrative because it's not true. The reality is life is more complicated than that. The reality is that sometimes things aren't easy to figure out. In fact, let me just move to this concept now of church and, and talk about the reality that it's not the same for everybody. How should the church be acting? How should, a, should church be having church? Should it be meeting in person? Should it not be meeting in person? Should, should we be uh, having you know, all of our services, some of our services? Well, first of all, it's a complicated question because it assumes that every church should operate the same way, and that's just not true. In fact, it's not true in any capacity of life. Every family operates a little differently. What is best for your family might not be best for mine. Certain principles and things that you guys might need to put in place for your families, for your families to operate correctly and most efficiently and the way that you need it to, might work differently for your neighbors across the street. This is why each family is responsible for determining how the family lives. This is true on a government level from the way cities operate, a state level on the way states operate, and the principle applies to the church. There is no simple answer. All churches should be doing this. As far as the Well Worship Center, we have did the best we can to respond to factual information. Your leaders, you need to hear this, your leaders love you, we care for you, and at the end of the day, our ultimate goal is to shepherd the flock of God. And you know one of the primary roles of shepherds? To protect the sheep, to keep everybody safe. At the Well Worship Center, I got COVID. Now, thank God that I've recovered and thank God my family has been fine. But the reality is I got COVID. And the truth is, is that I started to notice symptoms on a Thursday morning immediately following a Wednesday night when I was in contact with a bunch of people. Our elders got together and discussed immediately the, these things on the weekend, and we felt the safest thing to do was to make sure that everybody had an opportunity that I was in contact with to find out who's going to be getting it, and, and we wanted to make sure that we did our part to stop the spread of this thing. It was a hard decision to make. Trust me, nobody wants to be gathering and worshiping together more than I do, more than your elders do, more than your pastors or deacons do. We long for the church to be together, but we also want to be wise in what we do. You know, since then, and thank God we made the decisions we did, because since then we have found that a handful of people who have contacted or contracted COVID have had a very difficult time fighting off this virus. People are responding to it very differently. You guys need to be praying for our sister, Laura Haas. She's been in the ICU now for almost a full week, looking at blood transfusions, having oxygen issues. And I just want to plead with you guys, be praying for her, be praying for her family. There are a handful of others that are really having a hard time with this. And imagine, honestly, imagine where we'd be had we not done anything 
to try to stop the spread of this COVID in our midst. Now, what we needed to do was based upon a unique scenario at the Well Worship Center. We would certainly not recommend every church, even in Derby, Wichita, Kansas, or this nation for that matter, would be responding exactly like we are in this exact season of time. This is the important part to understand, brothers and sisters, is that every church needs to function according to the needs of that church. Our church is doing that now. And I can assure you, we are, we are praying and working towards doing everything we can to be regathering and worshiping together. The next thing I want to talk about is this, uh, what I would call uh, this, this drive for personal freedom. This desire for, you know, my rights and people taking away my rights. It's a very touchy subject. And I, I want to talk about it from the, I, and I want you to begin to look at it and think about it from the angle of influence. Listen, brothers and sisters, nothing matters more than our ability to influence our families, our neighbors, our communities, our city, ultimately this nation and this world for Christ. Nothing matters more. And you know what I'm really concerned of? I'm concerned that many of my brothers and sisters are diminishing their influence for Christ in their fight for something lesser. I wouldn't say your personal freedoms are utterly unimportant. I'm not saying that. But I am telling you this, there is nothing more important than having influence for Jesus. It doesn't matter what side of the rope you're on. It doesn't matter what side of this tug of war you're on. Calling people idiots immediately diminishes influence. Telling people they don't love others if they don't buy into your side of the story, it immediately diminishes your influence. A lot of these, what I would call emotional arguments, is what we turn to when you know, we start throwing dust when we don't get our way and we get emotional and we appeal, uh, we appeal emotionally. You got to guard your heart against that. And, and, and you've got to be careful to not be throwing out these, these hurtful statements towards people that disagree with you. Whether you try to, you know, let's, let, let's use masks, for example. Whether you're on the side that believes everybody should be wearing masks or whether you're on the side that believes masks don't work. I've seen people on both sides just say foolish things as Christians that are diminishing your Christian influence. Stop it. Quit being mean-spirited and recognize this argument is so small in the grand scheme of things. You know what I'm really concerned about is that once this blows over, if this does, if we come out of this season of strange life that we're in and the Lord doesn't return in the immediate future, my concern is that on the back side of this, we will have diminished our influence with the very people we need to reach. Good luck telling that person at work that he's an idiot for the way he thinks. Good luck trying to tell that person about Jesus ever again. Good luck trying to tell that person that doesn't see it the way you see it, that they must not love you and they must not love their grandma and they're selfish and they don't care about anybody. And they might. Good luck telling that person about Jesus in the future. I want to caution us, brothers and sisters, to be very careful what hill we choose to die on. I want to be very cautious, brothers and sisters, that we take some time to pause and think about what really matters most. You know, what's happening and part of what's confusing for a lot of folks is that for the first time in our lives, we're being forced in a lot of ways to choose between our country and our God. And in this country, that just hasn't been the case for so many years. For most of us, our Christianity and our patriotism have seemed to go hand in hand and there's, there's not a conflict. And all of a sudden, we're starting to see conflict. Now here's the reality. We're part of two kingdoms. We're part of an American kingdom. We're part of an earthly kingdom and we are part of a greater heavenly eternal kingdom, the kingdom of God. 
And what's important is to note that when those kingdoms come in conflict, when standing for one kingdom causes us to diminish our influence in the other kingdom, we must always choose to stand on the side of God, even if that means laying down our rights, laying down our personal freedoms in our earthly kingdom. You know, this is a hot topic for a lot of people because people that we love, people that we respect, our grandfathers, our great-grandfathers, some of your fathers, some of your sons, friends, family, some of our closest people have died for the American freedoms that we have. And that does ring an incredible emotional bell in our heart, and it should. And when we see certain freedoms that these people died for us to have, it can become a very emotional response. And I'm not saying it shouldn't be. I'm just trying to help paint the picture of what's going on. The dust is flying. Let's focus in and understand why are we so angry and what are we fighting about? This is a hot topic for a lot of people that feel like the freedoms that we have were shed, paid for with blood. And we can't just let them go. We can't just let them trickle away. On one hand, I agree to that. I really do. But listen to me. There was one man whose sacrifice was more significant, whose sacrifice was even greater than all other sacrifices combined. And that is the man Jesus. And we must see his sacrifice, that which he died for us to be able to do, to be able to possess. The rights that he died for us to have are far more superior than any rights that could be handed to us in the earth realm. The reason this is important is because when it's all said and done, what matters most is our influence in Christ's kingdom. And I just want to challenge you all. Take a moment. Some of us need to stop and recognize we've been saying too much. Who's it really helping? Who's it really changing? What's, what's it help when you tell somebody that they're an idiot because they don't agree with what you agree? Who, who does that help? Who does that win? Some of us need to stop and sincerely take a moment to breathe and look ourselves in the mirror and ask ourselves, what are we doing? What are we fighting? Because God teaches us that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness in this wicked age. And you and I need to put on the whole armor of God we need to recognize our greatest fight is a faith fight. You know, I want to give you an example of how I personally respond to this concept with masks. You want to know what I believe about masks? Not that it matters. I'm not a doctor, but let me tell you what I believe about them. I don't think they work very well. But I'm going to tell you why I believe that. I believe that because the CDC said they didn't work nearly four months ago. And now the same CDC, exact same people, they haven't got a whole new slew of doctors in there and scientists, the same people are now telling us something different. What happened? Did they finally get educated by real doctors? I mean, there's a political component to all of this. Dr. Fauci himself said, don't go out and wear a mask. They're not needed. Healthy people don't need them etc., 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 and then now he's saying, oh, you need to wear one. I personally spoke with a medical doctor, someone that I trust, someone that I trust with my life, my family, my health. This medical doctor looked me straight in the eyes and told me the same thing. These masks don't really work. I quote when he said, we normally, we mainly wear these because of everybody's anxiety. They'd panic if we didn't have them on. But you know, the truth is the virus spreads in a whole lot of other ways. One of the ways it spreads is mainly by people touching their face, their eyes, their mouth. 
And when you have a mask on, the number of times that you actually take and touch that with your hands and move your face, move it around your face, you end up making contact hands to face a whole lot more than you do without a mask. The point I'm trying to make is that people who don't think you should be wearing a mask, there's literal evidence on that side of the coin too. It's just not that simple. Now, now that I've told you how I feel about masks, let me explain, you know, applying the policy that I talked about concerning laying down our rights and not dying on any hill. I wear one. I don't fight it. No, I don't think someone's stealing my freedom. I do have the power to not wear one if I don't want and deal with the consequences. For me, that's selfish. It's just silly. Why would I want to diminish my influence with anybody over something so small? So I put the thing on and I don't make a deal about it. And I wear it where I'm supposed to wear it and I take it off when I leave. And guess what? My life hasn't changed. I have learned that I must be willing to lay down certain things in my life. Look, the Bible tells us if it offends your brother to eat meat, don't eat meat around him. We must be willing to listen, uh, show empathy, um, compassion, and love to all people, brothers and sisters. We don't want to lose our influence. I think about the reality that, you know, we talk about, I've seen people say, I shouldn't have to wear a mask because of your shame or your fear. Well, Jesus didn't have to do what he went through, but you look at the shame that he endured. You look at the pain that he went through. You look at the humiliation. You, you really consider how he died. Stripped naked. Beaten publicly. Imagine being beaten so bad publicly that you almost died from the beating itself. And then to be crucified. It was humiliating. I can assure you this. It was a million times more humiliating than you wearing a mask. You know why he did it? For you and for me. I think we need to stop again as Christians. And as I said earlier, really look ourselves in the mirror. And be careful not getting caught up in a fight that we really shouldn't be in in the first place. All right. Next concerning our government. Listen, we live in a country where we're able to vote. We are able to participate in the government. I, I really believe we have the greatest country on the planet. And we need to be involved. We need to be committed. We need to be uh, praying for our leaders. We need to be praying for um, our, our communities. We need to be praying for Christians to rise up and, and, and help lead our government in the right place. But I want you to hear me out on what I'm about to say. I do not believe that the government leads the culture. I believe it follows it. I think the government is actually behind the times and that the current government we have is always a, um, a picture, if you will, of the culture that came before it. We're the ones that vote these people in. Now, the reason that's important is because if I'm right about that, the real way to change our government is less about getting people to out to vote. You need to vote. Don't hear me wrong. I'm talking big picture here. It's less about getting people out to vote. And it's more about changing our culture. You want to change the government next year? You want to change the government four years from now? You want to make sure that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, the nation that our children have is better than the nation today? It, it's gonna, it doesn't start with a government that forces the right laws upon our people. It starts by winning our culture. And when you see that, what I said earlier becomes all the more important. We need influence for Christ, brothers and sisters. So I want to encourage you to do this. I want to encourage you to join me in praying like never before. I want you to begin praying for God to bring an awakening to His church. Because here's what the Bible teaches us. It teaches us that judgment begins in the house of God. Pray that God would give us the wisdom to quit playing tug of war with one another. To put down the rope, quit throwing dust and making matters worse, to walk away from it and to hit our knees and spend some time repenting ourselves. You'd be praying for 
our nation. You'd be praying for you. You'd be praying for our community and our city. You'd be praying for your leaders, your spiritual leaders at the church. Pray for us. We need wisdom and direction. And as far as what are we going to do moving forward, I, this is what I promise you. We're going to do what we've always done moving forward. Your elders are going to pray for the Holy Ghost to give us wisdom and direction about everything that we do. And we're going to do the best we can to be led by God, to be biblically accurate, to teach biblically, to live biblically, to operate biblically. And we're going to do everything in our power to make that happen. When we start services back up, the answer is very simple. As soon as your spiritual leaders have this general consensus that we feel safe, that when we move forward, we're not going to be putting people in harm intentionally, knowingly, in any capacity, and we sincerely feel safe about it. Guys, we love you. I love you. Thanks for listening, and God bless.